Hello and welcome back to the Big Lab Podcast. This is episode eight and today I'm joined with Nathan Collins. How's it doing? Yeah, good. Thanks, mate. Um, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. No worries. Do you want to just give yourself a bit of uh, an introduction for the people at home and watching? Uh, yeah, so uh, obviously my name's Nathan. Uh, I'm an online coach. Um, I used to be a training teacher sort of four or five years ago. Obviously made the transition into uh, coaching, first of all, kind of obviously one-to-one uh, PT in and then going into online coaching. And especially obviously, as we know what happened last year, kind of uh, fast-tracked that process uh, a little bit more, having to go full-time online. And um, and yeah, that, that's pretty much me, man. So you said you were becoming a trainee teacher. Was that in sports and PA and stuff like that? Or was it something completely different? Yeah, so I went to university, got a sports development and coaching degree. Uh, prior to that, I, I was um, coaching football and other sports. And then obviously the goal was to then uh, go into a primary school, become a teacher and obviously just assess my options from there. So I went in to do like a two-year course and then I was kind of halfway through the first year and I was just like, this just isn't for me. Um, and obviously like my teach, um, my sister's a teacher and obviously I know lots of other people that are teachers and and they do a you know incredible job. You know they have so much work, but for the position that I was in, it was just you know deep down you just know that's not really what you want to do. And I always knew that I wanted to go into fitness, but I guess social media wasn't as big back then. There wasn't as many kind of role models to look up to. I think at the time it was like Jamie Alderton, uh, Joe Delaney was another. So they were the kind of two main ones obviously looked up to. Um, and obviously they made that transition, I think it was, yeah, Easter 2017. Nice. So if you think about it, though, um, even though that wasn't the right decision for you at the time, at least you found out sort of doing it. I think that's the best way to go about it. Um, get that experience and then find out you don't like it. Bad experiences aren't always sort of bad in a way. They can be positive because they'll send you down the route that you want to go down in the end. Yeah, that, you know, that's so important. I always think that, like people shouldn't necessarily look and think, oh, if only I did that or only did, did this. Because at the end of the day, don't be wrong, like I'm in, you know, 60 grand debt with university and you know I don't even use my degree. But um, as my girlfriend always reminds me, and we always speak about if, if it was the other way around and when I was 18, 19 and I tried to become sort of a PT and online coach then, you know, I might have massively flopped for two years then went down to the teaching route and, and it would just be an officious cycle. So in some ways, like, have no regrets. Um, I always believe everything happens for a reason. I always felt like I was supposed to go down that path to find out what I really want to do is as kind of hippie as that sounds, but that's personally what I, I feel. And um, yeah, it was a, it was definitely an experience for sure. I assume as well, you kind of have partly used your degree in your PT sort of stuff because it gives you that prior knowledge before you even do your PT qualification I imagine that helped quite a lot it helped massively I think with dealing with people on a one-to-one -one basis I yeah. think prior to going into work in the school obviously I was at university and had a few kind of placements but I was still very very shy um, I guess I didn't really kind of find myself I didn't really have that kind of confidence so doing a year's kind of teacher training really kind of put myself out there so then when I went into the industry dealing with people, going up to them, speaking to them, I don't think I necessarily had that confidence issue. I know it's completely different teaching to, to kind of coach him, but that experience for, for sure definitely helped. Yeah, I think that's quite an important thing you say as well, because you could have all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't speak to someone on a one-to-one -one basis, then it's near enough useless to a point, isn't it? Yeah, I think anyone that's obviously listened to this that are in the industry and either like a you know a personal trainer online coach or doing something different if you don't have those kind of i guess people skills yeah. it's very hard to showcase all your passion all the knowledge all the help that you can offer to someone without actually being able to um articulate uh, or to, uh, sorry articulate and communicate with that particular person yeah definitely and it's like what you said if you may have gone down the pt route at 18 you might have completely flopped and i think at 18 you are obviously still gaining those interpersonal skills and still even growing up as a human being. And I think if you were to be an 18 year old trying to take on clients that are maybe, well, the majority will be older than you. 
and it's quite hard to almost tell someone that's older than you to do something i guess yeah definitely like i have the utmost respect for any kind of 18 19 20 year olds that are getting into this industry because it is very i wouldn't say it's cutthroat but you do have to especially to begin with you have to deal with a lot of like uncertainty and dealing with people or maybe working people that sounds bad but necessarily you don't want to work with and you know long term you know long term you're not going to be working with so it definitely takes a a lot of um a lot a lot to go into the industry and i i 100 agree that's why i say like everything happens for a reason that i think at the age of i think i was 22 at the time just turned 22 i had enough experience behind me to really kind of push on And, and like you said if i went into it when i was 18 19 would i be sitting here with podcasts for yourself talking about loads of other topics to do with fitness and and business probably not I'd, I'd maybe be a teacher right now it's um yeah it is interesting man and i know there's a lot of people that have obviously maybe different career paths but have kind of similar experiences to myself where they've had to kind of trial and error with one career before finding the passion that they they really want to do yeah it, well it's like me like you started off as a teacher i am currently well broadly speaking an accountant so mm nothing to do with fitness whatsoever but because I've got a fitness background from a young age and I've always been interested in it and I've always been interested in doing my PT qualification which is what I'm doing now I'm doing my level three at the moment um it's just one of those things isn't it like different paths can leave you down completely different routes and you just got to trust the process I guess you do definitely and for anyone listening to this podcast, like you said, you know, you, you're an accountant and obviously I don't know how many years you've been doing that and, and, and whatnot. Six and, and a half years. Six and a half years. So Since you know, I was 18, of, yeah. That's incredible. And, you know, you've put a lot of time and effort into that. But at the same time, you're absolutely, you know, you're so relentless and consistent on social media. You're so passionate about fitness that why shouldn't you go ahead and do something different you know you don't you don't have to necessarily be down one road and, and that's your lane and that's exactly what you have to do i think um you know a lot of people you know should be learning a lot from yourself that you can have both of those and yeah that's that's really important for sure yeah i think it's quite popular these days as well to almost have a bit of an online coaching side hustle as well i've noticed quite a few people that have nine to five jobs and then sort of maybe have five to ten clients on the side just to even earn just like a little bit of money on the side but uh my plan is to sort of scale it to the point where i can almost do it full time it's going to be sort of a transition process i think sort of not going all in too early it's it's going to take you time and i I think like a lot of people that make that transition you'll you'll be very surprised It, it does take them time as well yeah but like you said if you have the experience if you have value to offer you know even if you're helping one people over uh, one person over the course of the year or 10 people yeah. you know those people are going to benefit from yourself or other people you know just because you i know you're doing your court your qualification right now but just because you have a qualification or you have a certificate in something doesn't necessarily mean that you can help someone um you know yourself and other people like i said they've got lots of value to, to offer um so yeah that's that's really exciting man yeah i'm looking forward to it and i think that brings us nicely onto our first topic which is all about habits and i think to start off with we'll go with what actual habits do you currently have and why yeah massive one i think i spoke this on my um on my instagram post i did see that one actually yeah yeah about uh non-negotiables because for myself, like when you say habits, like I, I generally do think uh, I'd say a lot of people, obviously not everyone, but people do switch off. You think, oh, here you go again, like uh, constant habits, so boring, um, just the same thing doing, you know, day in day out. But I definitely think that, like, for for what I do in terms of uh, being an online coach and being very consistent on social media and you know trying to impact people's lives in in terms of fitness. I think habits are really important and non-negotiables because, you know, they're my values, they're my principles. So when I talk about, you know, um, trying to help someone with a particular fat loss goal or muscle gain goal, and we try and put those kind of uh, habits in place to allow them to um, to not necessarily think about that they're doing them, but still ultimately lead to that long-term result, I think it's really important. So just to reel off a few of mine, like, um, 
obviously I always try and read a chapter a day um, with a book over a certain kind of topic that I really want to kind of develop in and learn about steps you know calorie output is really important three to four liters of water every single day uh, one workout or mobility routine to do so all of those kind of individual habits obviously there's lots more all those individual individual habits I feel make me as a person and allow me to kind of do them without thinking about it and then allows me to have a positive impact on the day so yeah habits are massive man really yeah there's um it's more consistency isn't it at the end of the day like there's no point in doing say a workout every day for one week it's got to be over a sustained period of time to actually see a benefit which i think is where a lot of people fall down they think things are just going to happen in an instance when they don't realize you've got to i think james smith put it quite um basic the other day you're going to do the same 15 exercises for the rest of your life and as long as you do them consistently consistently you're going to see results definitely and i think um sometimes where i feel people go wrong and and definitely anything that i speak about you know i've been a culprit uh culprit myself in the past i think sometimes people can change things way too soon so it's like the all or nothing approach um so for example like i'll speak to people and they just say like yeah, my nutrition's really, really bad or my, my training's horrendous. And then the week after, it's my nutrition's really good and, yeah, I smashed all my training sessions. I think sometimes, you know, doing the basics really, really well on a consistent basis and forming those habits you spoke about goes a long way, not only in terms of the short term and getting the results, but, you know, you can sustain them over a long period of time. So when it comes to obviously changing things too drastically, it's like, you know, when it comes to nutrition, trying to cut every single processed foods you have out of your food, cutting out all breads, you know, making sure that you're eating so many greens in the day and all of those in, individually have their benefits. But to do it all at once, it's, you, you can do it for two weeks and then you're not gonna be able to sustain it. It's just, it's just not possible. Yeah, uh, this with all these uh, sort of fad diets as well, isn't it? Like cutting out carbs and this, that and the other and cutting out alcohol. Well, if that's a natural part of your sort of current diet, if you're used to eating those foods, if you're used to drinking that drink, if you just completely cut them out, you're just going to get massive cravings within a week, maybe two weeks at best. And then that's when you see sort of binge eating coming back in and then someone will have like a massive binge and then wonder why they've not got anywhere. And it's like, well, because you've kept at it for maybe like a week, but then on the weekend, you've just like tanked 10,000 calories. <laughs> And yeah, then wonder they're, why they're, they're not getting anywhere. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, you're you're absolutely spot on. You know, they've I wouldn't I wouldn't use the word starve, but like they you know made sure they didn't have any of those particular sweet foods four yeah. or five days, and then at the weekend, you know, you go out to a restaurant, you have a sniff of it, you know, you just want everything, um, yeah. and it's very difficult to have that kind of balance, and that's what obviously where where habits play a really important role. So, how exactly would you go about creating habits? Yeah, obviously, this is it's a very difficult question to, to kind of answer because obviously everybody is individual. But I personally feel like I don't know if anybody's read uh, James Clear um, Atomic Habits book, but it talks a lot about obviously habit stacking. So it's putting habits on top of your current habits. So everybody already has a habit, whether it's to, to obviously clean your teeth or you know set an alarm for a particular day. Everybody has a routine or structure they follow. So. I personally feel, you know, whatever your particular goal is or whatever you want to change, just put a habit on top of your current habits. So, for example, if you know you're not very good at getting your workouts in um, the following day or you feel like in the morning it's all a bit rushed, well, after you uh, clean your teeth, you could always um, set out your clothes to wear for the following day. So, you kind of, your, your initial habit is to clean your teeth and then once you do that habit afterwards, I'm going to set my clothes out for the following day and I, I think that's really important I think that's a really nice um, place to start from and, and that's what I do a lot of my team members you know rather than trying to change everything really really quickly yeah. it just doesn't work like that unless you know the very odd person can do it from from a mindset point of view and they're so purely focused on it um, but when you've got a family when you've got a really busy work life when you've got other external factors as we see what's happening in the world right now going on it's very difficult to to do that so yeah i, I think habit stacking um is, is is massive yeah i've not actually read that book it's on my list of books to read uh, but i've heard a lot of good things about it and i like that sort of idea of habit stacking that you've just said like, i've never heard of it before but i think i've subconsciously sort of done it 
Mm. It's sort of like, right, I'm going to do this and then this and then this. And you make a routine out of it, don't you? And then you get to the point where you almost feel awkward if you've not done it. And that, that's when you know that it's sort of ingrained. Like for me, uh, sort of when the gyms are open, go in the gym for me, it doesn't seem like a chore because it's a natural thing. It's what I've always done. Whereas to someone who's new to the gym, getting to the gym after work might be a bit uncomfortable. But then once you've, you get into that routine, it's right, I'm finishing work, now go into the gym. Then I'll have my dinner when I get home sort of thing. When you do that for a sustained period of time, then it's a habit. And I think that links quite well with, um, I assume you've seen the Gymshark 66 thing that goes around on Instagram every year, just after, I think it's just after New Year, is it? Mm. Which is, if nobody's heard about that listening, uh, basically, I think it's 66 days to make a habit stick, isn't it? Is that what it's all about, the whole? Yeah, I do know what, I'm not actually too sure myself, um, but something like that, yeah. Yeah, and... the only issue I have with that is I think people do it for the whole Instagram thing to try and win the competition for 66 days but then what I wonder is whether they keep it going for the rest of the year because obviously it comes around every year and you see I see like the same few people doing the challenge every year and I'm like well have have you not carried on what you did in the the one last year throughout the year or like what's going on It's, it's, it's massively important I think something like that like if someone's you know setting a habit or just trying to find accountability for whatever whatever they're doing, it's really important to then, prior to finishing that particular area they're focusing on, then already start planning for the next one. Or alternatively, you could think of, you know, setting a particular goal that you could use that habit to push you on. So like you said, in terms of workout, you know, you finish work, you have food, you go for a workout, that's all good for two or three months. But like, that becomes a bit repetitive, you know, if you don't have something to necessarily work towards. And I'm kind of jumping along a little bit too quickly here but once you've got the habit you've got to then work use that habit to work towards something otherwise you're gonna you're gonna stagnate and, and potentially plateau yeah and that's exactly where goals sort of link in with habits as well isn't it mm-hmm. having those incremental goals to then reach a sort of ultimate goal as a uh, so to speak but um i think this time over the last year has been one where I've definitely had to sort of focus on habits because obviously I've been working from home since March last year. So it's pretty much a year next week, I think, or something like that, that I've been working from home. And uh, at first, what I used to do was I'd just log on from my bed and then sort of work for a bit. And then when I got hungry, then I'd come downstairs. Whereas I started having to make the habit of sort of where I am now, this is basically my office. Um, I leave my laptop down here, so I have to get out of bed to log on to work because it just wasn't happening before. <laughs> that that's, that's obviously powerful, and, and I think that's really important. I know um, Carly, my girlfriend, when she, I think she was starting work, I, I think she had like flexi time between uh, 8 and 10 or something like that. Yeah. And she knew a lot of people that would stay in bed till, uh, a lot of her work colleagues that stay in bed to quarter to 10, roll out of bed, clock on, and obviously start working from there and obviously that's absolutely fine but I, I definitely feel that something like that like you, you probably noticed to begin with the more times you do it and you start to fall into that potential negative habit of not necessarily having something to to do in the morning or to kind of set you up for the particular day it then starts to potentially become a bit of a burden and obviously then you don't have your evenings and it just all feels repetitive so like you said it's really important you know, making sure you utilize that time in the morning, you're setting things out in place to ensure that um, you're getting done whatever you, you you know you want to do in I guess in a, in a positive way. So would you say that creating habits can help boost your confidence? Uh, per- personally okay, this is from a personal experience. I would I would say yes because when I guess when you have habits and then you kind of link it to obviously accountability to a degree and you tick those off, I feel confident that I've already completed, I guess, six tasks or six habits by 9am to allow me to push them for the rest of the day. And obviously, you know, doing things like this, like podcasts and that, feel confident because I haven't got anything to, to necessarily worry about uh, doing, which I've already kind of done. So I guess that point of view, like from my own personal experience, yes but um yeah i don't know 
potentially a bit of both. I would say that there is reasons for yes, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily say a hundred like doing habits every single day naturally leads to an increase in confidence. What about you? I'd I'd agree with you. Um, so for me, like I'm off work today and tomorrow, but what I do most days is I just go into my notes and if there's I'll, I'll plan it out the night before. So you know you can do the little sort of tick lists on your phone yeah, and your notes. Yeah. I'll write all the stuff that I need to get done before, well, not necessarily before something, but I'll just do them and then obviously tick them off throughout the day. So it keeps you accountable. And then it, in a way sort of keeps you confident that you've, I don't know, I guess sort of accomplished something throughout the day. Like even in my work life, I write a list for the week of all the tasks I need to do by the sort of the end of the week and then tick them off throughout the day. And then I guess that's a habit in a way. I, I know people would listen to this and like if we say like ticking those um, points off throughout the day or throughout the week is, is so pleasing. People are probably thinking that sounds so weird, but I promise you like if you to do it for a period of time, yep. I wouldn't say it becomes addictive, but it, it definitely comes very like, yeah, it becomes so pleasing. But like what really helps that I, I found myself, you know, and I don't want to throw the word like kind of anxiety around too much and stuff but i found in prior to obviously um habits and and um, planning my particular day i found that you know come 6 p.m or 7 p.m when i'm trying to you know relax in the evening and not try and do too much work i got so much of my mind going on that i was very very anxious before bed but once you kind of plan your particular day like you said and you have a mixture of your habits and, and tasks to do and you start ticking them off come six or seven you've ticked them all off like you feel amazing so yeah. I guess from a confidence point of view, like you said, I guess that does come because then you know you've done everything you can. You can wake up, do yeah. the same thing or similar things the next day and, and push on with, with everything for sure. Yeah, there's nothing worse than getting to that sort of six, seven, eight o'clock mark and you look at that list and there's still two or three items on there and then you've got to carry on doing whatever you've got to do. And then sometimes you might have to go, right, that can wait till tomorrow, which I don't like doing. I just like to get rid of it. But there's nothing more satisfying than seeing a list just full of ticks. For sure. Like you said, that's a completely different, um, yeah, you then that's another challenge in itself. Like if you're yeah. over, then, then um, put them over. But that's when obviously non-negotiables come in. Like what I try and do each, each day, which I'd highly recommend to anyone is, again, like those habits, they're the non-negotiables. Um, and then I create a negotiable. So there's some tasks that I need to do for that particular day. If I don't do them, it's fine because I'll just carry them over to the next day. And I think that those two parts of, you know, creating those habits and tasks, ticking them off, that's amazing initially if you struggle with obviously like a little bit of anxiety and you feel like you're not being productive. Then when you start to have the few left over, then, you know, then turn on to, you know, creating those non-negotiables and then negotiable. If you don't get them done, it's fine. We'll do them again there. Or complete them the next day yeah i like that because at the end of the day you don't want to be burning out you need that downtime of an evening sometimes and sometimes you've just literally got to listen to your body i think which is important and obviously every day is not the same so you could be busy one day which might mean might not be able to hit that step count for one day so which is why i do it as an average over the week because i've now started running on a tuesday and saturday which means i end up hitting more like 15,000 steps I think so that sort of helps a few of the other days where maybe I can't get out because I'm working and then I've got something else after work so yeah we weekly average is a, is a big one for sure yeah 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 because I think people focus too much on a daily basis instead of focusing on a week or a month maybe a month probably too far but I'd definitely say a weekly average is probably more achievable that's I guess that's the only negative downside of a particular habit is for example if you set yourself a, a goal of you know ten thousand steps every single day you know um, you know just just throw your obviously your your career and stuff like as an as an accountant you know there might be some days where you have like massive deadlines or some weeks which I'm I'm, I'm assuming you do yeah. like not every day is going to be the same like one day you might only be able to get sort of four thousand the next day might be ten thousand. You know, and then you're facing with, oh, but I want 10,000 every single day and it kind of plays in your mind. So switching to something weekly, you know, you can still have enough control of your time over the course of the week. So, yeah, that that's massive, George, for sure. 
Yeah, so to put it into perspective, like I sit here basically for eight hours a day. So <laughs> the only time I get out of my desk is basically to go to the toilet or to go to the kitchen for food. And most days after work, I'm looking at about a thousand steps for the day. So for me then, so say I finish at half four, five o'clock, I've got from maybe five until sort of 10, 11 o'clock to try and get all those steps in, which is just not so realistic especially if like the weather at the moment it's like hit and miss like the last thing i can be bothered doing is going out when it's chucking it down and it's blowing a gale so um i know you say about those non-negotiables but there's some things i just i don't i'm not bothered about the rain but going from being in a warm house to going into the cold rain just doesn't appeal to me whatsoever um i don't mind working out in the rain and things like that but there's So like, obviously I'm doing my PT qualification, which is taking time and I sort of have to weigh things up to say, right, what's more beneficial to me doing my PT qualification or getting a couple of thousand steps in. I just think I'll make up for it on other days where I do more activity. Yeah. And then obviously that's where obviously you got to prioritize, you know, at the end of the day, throughout the, throughout the whole week, got so much going on, you know, you can't get everything in. So then you have to obviously prioritize, you know, certain tasks over others. So yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely really important yeah and i think going into our sort of next topic i think that habits links in very well because obviously the gyms are open, well we hope are opening up on the 12th of april um and i think habits again are going to come into it uh quite a lot because a lot of people like including yourself you've had a small amount of weights mainly resistance bands haven't you mm. um and i think the majority of people out there are probably in a similar position where they've not lifted anywhere near what weights they usually would in the gym. Mm -hmm. And I think people going into the gym need to realize that. Otherwise there's going to be a lot of injuries if they go and try and lift their original weights, because you're not going to be able to pick up from where you left off. Yeah. I think it's really important. Like, like I said, hopefully 12th of April in the UK, that, that will be the day. Um, but those first initial couple of weeks, it's just getting back into the routine. Like you're so used to being at home and lots of things open up socially, obviously your own um, in- individual things that you enjoy doing, like going to the gym. So it's then finding those individual habits of, of going, to the, to going to the gym at a certain time and, and just getting back into to what you're doing. And, you know, if you, like myself, like I'm, like obviously I bought a power tower. I'm still waiting on like some plates for a barbell, which haven't haven't come. But you know, for the majority of all, all these um, lockdowns that we've been in, resistant bands and, and one dumbbell. So if you've been used to that, like myself, then obviously when we transition into the gyms and you've got hack squats, you've got chest press uh, machines, you've got like row machines, you've got so much there. Just just get back into it for the first couple of weeks and just start enjoying, you know, just training the gym again for sure. Yeah, I think it's important for people to definitely take the time because, I, like I said, like there's going to be a lot of injuries if you just try and go back in and go full, like, pelleted it. So if you were going maybe the gym five times a week, I'd probably recommend you start more three times a week and sort of slowly build yourself back in. Otherwise, those doms are just going to get to the point where you just can't be bothered going because you're in that much pain. Yeah, I agree. And definitely focus so much like... Um, on like mobility and recovery mm. and I, I guess you know that's a habit in, in itself you know it's, it's very easy to start doing those things and just kind of like falling off the wagon a little bit and you know myself you know I've been a culprit of it before where I start doing like mobility routines and then you know I've done them for a few days but you know they definitely play their importance going back in the gym looking after your body on the rest days making sure we're foam rolling making sure we've got our mobility routines there to to increase the range of motion in our joints and muscles, getting hot baths, firmer guns, if or whatever they're called, it, if you've got them. So um, yeah, that that's really important, like on your gym days and obviously on the rest days as well. well. That's I think people need to understand rest days are just as important as actual training days because if you're not letting your body recover, then it's not going to be able to grow and essentially recover. Um, and I think instead of people just going full pelt again they need to realize that the body does need to rest and recover otherwise you're going to probably be sidelined pretty soon going into the gym definitely i think um i think gone are the days where you you feel you necessarily have to go seven days a week training really hard of course like if 
I, I guess it's difficult to suggest like like for myself like I'll go I'll, I'll train five five times in a week maybe do another day of like mobility or something else so I guess I'm contradicting myself a little bit but in those particular days it's like just smart recovery around there and and making sure that certain muscle groups that you're working you're not working for a couple of days and, and things like that so yeah like exactly like you said George like recovery days are equally as important and I think it does take a bit of time because I guess maybe not necessarily the generation now but like for ourselves like I don't know when you first start training but when I was you know 17 18 and like 2012 and I was reading things off like bodybuilding.com and like gone on YouTube videos, like training motivational videos. If you got to train every single day and you got to do yeah. 2000 rep arm days. Um, I like to think that those kind of days have gone. Maybe they're still in and around us now. Or some people still post like content like that. But um, I think, yeah, like you said, recovery is, is, is so important, man. Yeah, I started going to the gym when I was 15, so it's about nine and a half years ago now I've been going to the gym. So, yeah, I definitely saw all those ridiculous workouts. I, I didn't tend to actually do any of them, but I'm seeing a lot of them pop up on things like YouTube now. People trying to go viral doing like a, I think it's like an Arnold workout, which like you say is like 2,000 reps or something ridiculous. And I do hope those sorts of things are gone because they are just ridiculous. Like these people were sort of trained to be like that and they're eating ridiculous amounts of calories every day and they're all pumping gear and all sorts yeah like, your local fella down the gym should not be doing that workout it's not going to benefit anyone and you're just going to goose your tendons and ligaments and muscles and everything oh 100 percent. and i guess something like that when you do like reps and reps and reps obviously it all comes down to volume so if you're doing a, you know like i said 2000 rep arm workout of course your arms will grow um because of the amount of volume that you're doing but it's not necessarily because of that particular session and like you said you know there's you know it might be good over that period of time those couple of years but you know as you'll see over the period of time you, your joints will be destroyed by doing you know thousands of skull crushes from the floor and yeah it's um just gonna yeah. lead to overtraining isn't it yeah yeah so there was actually a video that i did um for the first time the gyms reopened and it was sort of my five tips so the first, i've got them written down here so the first one was like we've talked about which is taking it easy and i think it's important to just drop your weights and just get used to the movements again because like you said you've had like resistance bands and like one dumbbell which you can't do a, well you can do a, quite a lot with but nothing compared to what you can do in the gym especially with the sort of machines, the cables and things like that. Number two was not to be disheartened. So obviously you're going to go back into the gym, not being able to lift what you were lifting. How many months ago it was like three months ago, four months ago. And I think a lot of people have got to sort of realize that for someone like me, I've been quite lucky that I've got a bench and a squat now, so I can lift a decent amount of weight, but I'll probably still go into the gym and not lift my usual weights because there's only so much you can do with a barbell and a bench at the end of the day. There's still exercises that I've not been doing because I just physically can't. <laughs> um, number three, I've actually said, don't go back to your old routine. So say if you were going back in the gym, let's say before the, uh, the gym shut, you were doing five, six times a week. Like we've said, you need that rest, like that extra rest for now until your body's sort of back in the routine of doing those sorts of volumes on a weekly basis. Uh, Number four, I've said take advantage of lifting less to correct your form. So quite a lot of people you see in the gym these days, ego lift. And what I've always said from the get-go pretty much is form over weight. There's no point in lifting a weight with incorrect form because along the line somewhere you're either going to get an imbalance or you're seriously potentially going to injure yourself. So that's why you'll never see me doing like a ridiculous thing on Instagram because I'd rather lift it properly and get the benefit of that because you're probably going to get more benefit out of lifting a lesser weight with correct form anyway. Mm -hmm. Number five, uh, it just enjoy the process of getting strong again. We're, we're basically all not necessarily newbies again, but just enjoy the process of progress, I guess. Yeah, that, that's, that's massive. I think all of those points that you've kind of touched on there, it, I guess it kind of all correlates to, I wouldn't say pressing the reset button, but 
but kind of just taking a bit of a step back yeah. to allow yourself to, to take two steps forward. Something that obviously I did myself and I got a lot of my team members to do and, and suggested to other people on social media was, I think it was in the first lockdown, obviously four months or so without a gym, you know, work on your, if you haven't got a lot of kit, you know, work on your mobility. So when you go back in the gym and you want to do your squats, and you want to do your bench press, and you want to be, do your bent over rows, over a period of time, not initially, but you'll be able to do more weight because you have so much, like, so much better range of motion in your joints and muscles and and like you said there you know just start focusing on on form again and you know don't go back into your old routine you know just take it slow um i think he's made some yeah your your points there are absolutely spot on and and definitely applying to you know from april 12th and beyond for sure yeah form is the one that gets me the most i think because you tend to see it's it's usually a group of young lads in the gym isn't it trying to sort of outlift one another and then it gets to the point where it gets to that sort of risky point where they can't quite lift the weight and the form's all over the place and you just look at them just like, no. <laughs> um, and I think it's just people just need to leave their ego at the door and just realise that they're going to get more benefit out of lifting the weight properly with maybe you can throw a pause rep in there, a one and a quarter rep. There's so many things that you can do to benefit using a lesser weight. Yeah, definitely. Um, I 100% agree. If you can create that foundation first with that particular weight, like you said, get that form, that range of motion, the tempo, the contraction there, gives you a really nice foundation to start start with. And even if you don't even push on too much from there, you're probably going to make more of a pro- more progress doing that properly than you will half repping or half squatting, you know, half you know bounce off your chest. You know, it's um, yeah, def- definitely agree. Yeah, it's something that um, sits with me quite strongly. <laughs> and especially when you see it on social media, you get so tempted to just comment. and It's like, uh, you're just going to cause beef on social media. But at the end of the day, it's going to help someone. It's like um and ah in between <laughs> whether you can tell someone the form's rubbish or not. But we'll see. <laughs> I, I, I think it's like, that's the power of social media. I think like, obviously what I try and do, obviously it's from my own experience is, obviously why I try and produce content to obviously external people that obviously aren't in, in my in my online coaching team is just to educate. So of course, you know, say something if it needs to be said and you think it's going to benefit others, but just use your platform to help others. Like even if you're getting 10 views on a video, a hundred views or a thousand views, like people are going to see that, hopefully learn from it and then implement it. And I guess like, that's probably how you learn some certain things and, and myself and, and loads of other people watching this podcast like you don't know what you know now and obviously there's still so much more to learn without that knowledge like when I first start watching like YouTube videos or reading things that's why a lot of people as beginners train horrendously wrong and start eating the wrong things and cutting out carbohydrates is because you see that type of content until you kind of fall um, into social media platforms of people that are very educational that help you you can learn like really quick and easy tips and obviously that's like for example like tiktok you know people bash tiktok so much and and understandably so to a degree but it's such an amazing platform like you only got to see with instagram reels the whole reason they've done that is to obviously battle with tiktok but tiktok's amazing you can watch something from 10 or 15 seconds you can learn so much that's going to improve your training habits, your nutritional habits, sleep, recovery. Um, yeah, it's massive. I think the, the disappointing thing for me on Instagram, though, is you see all these people with all the knowledge and putting out decent content and doesn't tend to reach as many people because obviously it's not as entertaining. Quite a lot of the time it is those people doing stupid lifts like one rep max deadlifts and one rep max benches over the presses you name it it's all like you, you don't have to scroll far to see something which is i think why people need like a lot of people don't understand that a like a share a save comment helps and goes a long way um so i think people who are listening if you see these sort of uh, educational posts you need to be tagging people in that you might sort of it might help along the line and share them because say if one person shares it to a thousand people a person within that thousand people might see it and then share it and share it and share it 
And I think that that needs to happen a lot more. And it is, to be fair, like you see the likes of James Smith and Darren Cartel and all all those sorts of fellas on Instagram now that are putting these mo- uh, not motivational, educational posts out. And they are t- starting to reach people and people are starting to understand the amount of rubbish that is out there on social media these days. Yeah, and it definitely spirals. It creates momentum um, and and hopefully reaches you know a much bigger audience. But I, I agree. I think, unfortunately, that's just... That that is just social media. People want yeah. things that are quick and easy, even if it's you know probably incorrect facts. Um, I myself probably have done certain videos that maybe aren't one hundred percent correct, but maybe without knowing or misleading. I, I think that's just the name of the game, and 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 social media and different platforms have different ways of of pushing content, and you just got to find how you can kind of create content in that niche, the ones that the social media platforms like. But somehow created educational and um, and, and and do it that way, which definitely definitely everyone has the opportunity to to do so. Yeah, it's finding that balance, isn't it? Like I've got on my Instagram, I've got a how to section, which is basically form on different exercises that I basically I'd go into the gym, I'd see someone doing it wrong, and think, right, I'm going to make a video on that. And I haven't posted on it for a little while. Um, I do need to sort of pick it back up again and get some more exercise out there. But they've definitely helped a few people just through the comments that I've received on the back of them, which, like you said, like if, if you get a few, 10 views, 100 views, 1,000 views, someone's going to see it and it's probably going to help someone. And if for me, if one post helps one person, then that's all that matters. It's done its job. That's important. And like you, like you said, you know, that one thing that you can help someone, you've impacted somebody's somebody's life, hopefully. And, and yeah, that that's powerful for sure. Yeah. And I'd, I'd personally like to see like in the gym because obviously there's PTs that work on the gym floor and I know sometimes they don't want to help people because they're not going to get paid for it but it could be a potential client at the end of the day if you go up and help someone with an exercise they might not necessarily like being like someone coming up to them and saying right you're you need to do this this and this but at the end of the day if that helps someone and they turn it on and go I'd actually like to work with them sort of thing then it's a potential client and you see you see PTs walking around the gym floor and you can see, like, you don't have to look far before you see some bad form, especially in a commercial gym. Uh, like, I go I go to a JD gym. I'd just like to see people go up to them and sort of help them a bit more. Like, I'd like to do it myself, but it's like, there's that borderline, isn't there? Especially when I'm not qualified as a PT or anything like that. But, yeah, it's a difficult one. It is a difficult one. It is a, it is a fine balance, if I'm honest. Like, obviously when I was on a on a gym floor I would definitely speak to people but I guess that's where going back to the very start of our podcast and obviously the people skills mm. it's been able to able to articulate yourself and kind of help them in, in the correct way and, and to try to define what the correct way is it's not black and white it's, it's very difficult to, to obviously talk about but there is there is definitely a way of helping people that you feel need to be helped um, without sort of saying yeah do this do that because like at that particular time whatever you're doing or whatever you're suggesting might not even be right anyway like yeah. obviously not yourself or, or me but just just in general so yeah definitely if you can pass some knowledge and you can do it in a in a really simple format that's going to benefit that person then 100% go for it for sure yeah definitely so just before we finish up have you got any more tips on going back to the gym to add to the five I do you know what I just think like just enjoy it like yeah. we I I'll happily admit this year has, has been tough for myself from a training point of view like obviously I, I guess the weather doesn't help and space and things like that but if you haven't got much equipment like I'm craving getting underneath a barbell or getting into a hack squat and I just can't wait for that and I know a lot of people are the same and you know maybe just don't take this time for granted again and of course we never know what the future is going to hold but you know, fingers crossed. You know, gyms might not be shut again um, yeah. for however many years, and you know, just never, you know, just never take this time for for granted, and and just enjoy it. Get back into the routine. Start setting yourself goals, and and just make you know, make twenty twenty one your year. Yeah, I think I'm going to be a bit of a, a kid in a sweet shop when the gym's open. I'm going to probably just go on everything that I've not been on for the past three months. I've definitely missed cables, like big time missed cables. So I am looking yeah, I forward to getting back on some cable. I'll probably first workout will probably just be a cable only workout. <laughs> in your area for like an hour. <laughs> yeah, literally. Well, that's what I had to do actually before the gym shut. So, you know, when it was like a tiered system, 
like the town on from us went to tier four, but we were still tier three. So a load of them came into our gym on the last day of the gyms, like being open. <laughs> and it was ridiculous. I basically got on a cable and just went, like, I'm staying on here because there's nothing else free. Like it was that busy. I'd never seen it so busy. And I spoke to one of the PTs in there and he said, this is only 80% capacity. I was like, what? There's like not a single item free. <laughs> like how, how can it be 80%? It was ridiculous. But yeah, hopefully... Uh, the gyms are open long, long period now because it's annoying, isn't it? The stop start getting back into it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Fingers crossed. Obviously, we never know what you know the next day brings, but once they're open, hopefully they're open and um, yeah, and, and can push on from there. Perfect. Right, I'll give you last opportunity to um, plug your Instagram where everyone can find you. Yeah, so uh, my Instagram's Nathan another n and then collins um obviously that's my instagram but of course like, i use different social media platforms tiktok twitter youtube um i think that's the majority of them so uh, if you go into my instagram if you want to follow me on on any of those then you know just go straight into my link tree and and, and you can check those out well there as well as if you're watching on youtube i'll put them all in the sort of bio thing uh, below um, but if you're listening this far and you are watching on YouTube, make sure you drop a like and if you're new, subscribe and we'll see you in the next one.